every compact lamination admits a harmonic measure. So it makes sense to talk about typical leaves of a lamination. In this lecture, we prove the following theorem of Gis. Let lambda be a compact surface lamination and let mu be a harmonic measure. Then mu almost every leaf is either compact or homeomorphic to one of the following six surfaces. The plane, the Loch Ness monster, the cylinder, the ladder surface, the sphere minus a canter sec, or the blooming canter tree. This last surface is the non-compact surface with a canter set of ends, all non-planar. Another way of stating the conclusion of the theorem is to say that mu almost every non-compact leaf has either one, two, or a canter set of ends, and the genus is either zero or every end is non-planar. Schiess's theorem is a corollary of a more general statement valid for compact laminations of any dimension. Gis calls this the proposition fundamentale. It says the following. Let lambda be a compact lamination with leaves of any dimension and let mu be a harmonic measure. Then for every Borel set B contained in lambda of positive mu measure, for mu almost every point X in the set B contained in a leaf L sub X of lambda, the intersection of L sub X with B exits every end of LX. Let's begin the proof of the proposition fundamental. We start by making two simplifying assumptions. First of all, the support of a harmonic measure is closed and saturated, meaning that it is a union of leaves. So without loss of generality, we may assume that mu has full support. Furthermore, an atom of mu is always concentrated on a compact leaf for which the conclusion is vacuous. So again, without loss of generality, we may assume that mu has no atoms. The key idea is that of recurrence. Leafwise Brownian motion on the compact space lambda preserves the finite measure mu. Since the measure of B is positive, Quancare recurrence implies that leafwise Brownian motion starting at any point X in B will return to B infinitely often, almost surely. Let's quantify this recurrence statement. Given a parametrized path gamma, let's let R gamma be the smallest positive integer such that gamma I is contained in the set B. And then let R of X be the expected value of R of gamma, where gamma is leafwise Brownian no motion starting at the point X. Then Poincaré recurrence is equivalent to the statement that R is finite for mu almost every point X in the Borel set B. In a similar way, we can define R sub N of X to be the expected time for the nth return of the point X to the set B under leafwise Brownian motion. Again, for mu almost every point X in the set B, R sub n of x is finite. In summary, we have shown that leafwise Brownian motion is recurrent in the compact lamination lambda. But what does it look like when we restrict to a leaf L sub x? Let's let L be a non-compact leaf of our lamination, and let's let k be a compact subset, and let x be a point in a non-compact component of L minus K. 
define r sub k of x to be the expected time before Brownian motion starting at the point x will enter the compact subset k, if it ever does. The fundamental point is that r k of x is infinite. This is perhaps rather surprising. Let's prove this claim. The leaf L has bounded geometry. What this means is that every end has at least linear growth. So we can compare this claim to the analogous case of a random walk on Z. Let's take a random walk on Z, which at every step moves left or right with equal probability. If we start at some non-zero point and we run the random walk, we can ask what's the expected time before the random walk returns to the origin? As is well known, the random walk does return to the origin, in fact, infinitely often. However, the expected time it takes before it returns to the origin is infinite. Here's the proof. Let's let r of n be the expected time before a random walk on the integers starting at the integer n returns to zero. We want to show that rn is infinite when n is positive. Evidently, r of n is increasing. r of n plus 1 is at least as big as 1 plus rn, because the first step can get no closer to the origin than to move from n plus 1 to n. Second of all, we have a recurrence relation. r of n is equal to 0 if n is 0, and otherwise is equal to 1 plus the average of r n minus 1 and r n plus 1. Let's add up this inductive formula for r n from n equals 0 to big N. The sum from n equals 0 to big N of our little n is equal to big N plus the sum from n equals 0 to big N minus 1 of our n plus boundary term. The boundary term is r big N plus r big N plus 1 over 2 minus r 1 over 2. Rearranging this, we see that r big N over 2 is equal to big N plus r big N plus 1 over 2 minus r 1 over 2. This contradicts monotonicity. If r 1 is finite, then r big N plus 1 will be smaller than r big N when big N is sufficiently big. Therefore, r 1 is infinite, and the same is true for r n for every positive n. Essentially, the same argument proves a claim for a leaf of a compact lamination. So we can conclude that if L is a leaf and K is a compact set and X is a point outside that compact set, then the expected time Brownian motion takes to enter the compact set K starting at X is infinite. Now let's prove the proposition fundamental. Supposing we have a point x in our Borel set B contained in a leaf L, and suppose there's some compact subset K of the leaf and a non-compact component F of the complement of K, which is disjoint from the Borel set B. There's a positive probability that random walk on L starting at the point x will enter F. But once it gets there, the expected time before it leaves f is infinite. And therefore, for some integer n, r sub n of x is infinite, contradicting the finiteness of r sub n of x mu almost everywhere. It follows for mu almost every point x in b, and for every end of the leaf L containing x, 
that the end must intersect the Borel set B somewhere. This concludes the proof of the proposition fundamental. Now let's begin the proof of Gis's theorem. We assume a harmonic measure mu has no atoms and has full support. The first part of the argument, valid in any dimension, shows that for mu almost every leaf, there is either one, two, or a counter set of ends. Let's construct a suitable Borel set. Fix a positive number r. If L is a leaf of lambda, let's let B sub r of L be the set of points x in L with the following property. If k is a compact set of diameter at most r, and the distance in L from x to k is at least r, then the component of L minus k containing x has at least two ends. Roughly speaking, B sub r of L are the set of points in L for which there is a certificate of diameter roughly order of r which certifies that L has at least three ends. In other words, a compact subset J of L of diameter at most r which separates L into at least three non-compact components. Now let B sub r be the union over all leaves L of B sub r of L. We claim that B sub r is Borel. Here's the proof. For a point x to be in B sub r of L means that there's a set J sub x contained in the ball of radius r around x, which separates L into at least three unbounded components. The trouble is, this is hard to witness in a compact subset of L, and therefore its dependence on leaves of L might vary unpredictably. So we need to quantify the meaning of separating L into at least three unbounded components. For any triple r less than r1 less than r2, let's let b r r1, r2 of L be the set of points x for which there's a subset j of x of the ball of radius r around x such that b r1 of x is split by j x into at least three components of diameter at least r1 which do not become connected or compact in the ball of radius r2 of x. The property of being in B R R1 R2 is local. It depends only on the geometry on a bounded scale R2, and therefore it defines a Borel subset of the lamination. If we then take the intersection over all R2 going to infinity for fixed R1, we get a Borel set B R R1. Taking the intersection over all R1 going to infinity we get the original set BR and therefore certify it as Borel. Now, the proposition fundamental implies that for mu almost every point x in the set BR, the leaf LX intersects BR in every end of LX. Since this is true for all R, it follows that for mu almost every point x, either L of x is disjoint from every B of R, which implies that L of x has at most two ends, or L of x has no isolated ends, which implies that its set of ends is a counter set. Next, let's discuss planarity. Define G sub R of L to be the set of points x in the leaf L for which the ball of radius R around x contains a once-punctured torus. 
then define G sub R to be the union of G sub R of L over all L. Evidently, this is Borel because it only depends on the topology of leaves on a fixed scale. Therefore, by the proposition fundamental, for mu almost all x, either x is contained in some g sub r, which implies that every end of the leaf L sub x is non-planar, or x is contained in no g r, which implies that the genus of its leaf is zero. This concludes the proof of Gis's theorem.